Hello again. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining this uh, session. It's a uh, focus on mass spectrometry. I will I would like to talk about a uh, peak decoder. It's a uh, an, an algorithm and a workflow that I created to identify uh, molecules from mass spectrometry data, combine it with other, other uh, separation techniques. Um, uh, I, I decided this is more like a tutorial. And then I realized that we have some people that are not very familiar with machine learning. So I thought it would be useful to, to add some uh, general concepts to, to clarify that might help and encourage people to use more machine learning. Um, then I will talk about these two uh, techniques that I use uh, to collect mass spectrometry data and then how we are combining them to get a more uh, a richer set of uh, information that will help to, to identify molecules more confidently. And that's the base, the algorithm that I created is to process that kind of data. And yeah, so finally I will go through details to the algorithm. Oh, well, the first thing that I wanted to talk, it's, uh, yeah, we, are, we call this meeting, it's AI ML. And then a lot of people don't understand what is the difference and get confused. And it's, it's very simple. So AI is basically the, the, the generic term and it's what's going in the, in the 1950s. So it's really, along yeah, in that timeline there are there are subsets um so yeah we have ai then machine learning and new deep uh, new, new artificial neural networks and deep learning which are the the latest uh more recent developments here just a general concept uh one of the most, more, more important things that will help you identify what kind of algorithms you need to your problem, it's the, if you have uh, labels or not. So what this means, what we call, we heard a lot today and yesterday in the session, supervised and supervised. So what does that mean? It means like, depending on your kind of data and your problem, if you know what you're looking for, you have labels like examples and labels that you want to, you can use to train your machine learning model, then it's called a uh, supervise. If you don't have any label in this case, um, in this case on, on the left, uh, where we apply, for example, example of those, those uh, methods are uh, clustering. It means you have your set of data, but you don't have labels. So that's called unsupervised. And then the, alg the algorithm what it use some uh, similarity or, or distant metrics to compare the examples in your data and then create groups depending on the similarity, right? And, and then uh, we have, yes, depending on the output, if you want to classify, if you want to give the model one, um, one example and, 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 do, and make a prediction of a label, a specific category, then that's called uh, a classification. Uh, so, for that, we have that there are several uh, classical algorithms, and there are many, many. Um, uh, we cannot see here the the reference. Um, how can we do that? Do you know how I can remove that bar? Because then people cannot see. I'm recommending here a review where people can check. But then, depending on the output that you want uh, your, the model to give you, then you can be like a discrete or continuous. So these are basically basic, the most basic concepts that you need to take into account when you want to apply machine learning to, to solve your, your problem. Where? Uh, I can read it, but it's not really. Your options. Need to stop sharing off here.
Evet. Okay, well, if people are interested, I can share those references, I guess. Okay, so now, in the context of mass spectrometry, uh, why, why we care about mass spectrometry or why we even dedicated a session for that. Because mass spectrometry, it's the tool that helps you uh, understand the molecule, molecule, molecular profiles at the phenotypic level. So if we have here this example of a cell and have, we, have, we know we have different uh, expression of molecules, we have metabolites, uh, proteins, uh, external, uh, or xenobiotic, all the kind of metabolites that are all interacting. We have the genetic information, right? But then the mass spectrometry is a tool that uh, will allow multiomics uh, analysis. And in this example, we can see the workflow for uh, mass spectrometry analysis. In, the, in this case, it's for, for metabolites, but it will be very similar for, for uh, proteomics. Um, so we have analytical methods, then the data processing, the data interpretation in any, every step of those, as we saw this morning from Professor Fernandez's uh, presentation and also Olga Vites, we need machine learning uh, applied in every of those uh, steps. Now, uh, difference between machine learning and deep learning. So, as I say, yes, uh, the general uh, concept is machine learning. The deep learning is a, a subset of the machine learning methods, but a key difference and what it lead, had led to the success of the deep learning methods is that this, this uh, feature extraction step is done automatically by deep learning methods. So for classical machine learning methods, you have to uh, go through a process that is called feature extraction or even feature engineering to see uh, how you, you can de uh, describe each of your examples to give input to the model, then you need to uh, basically create vector representations uh, to, to give into the model. So you, you don't provide the raw data. But with deep learning models, you can provide, you can train your algorithm to, to learn from the very raw data without telling it specifically, okay, no, you have to count for like the number of atoms of how many circles you have of shapes, right? Now, the model through these uh, uh, deep layers of, of, of neural network will learn to, 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 to extract those paths automatically. And the other key difference is that because it learns from the raw data, it can, as you provide more and more information, more, more examples, more training data, then the model can improve the, the performance, which is not the case with traditional machine learning algorithms. All right, so now we'll talk about uh, mass spectrometry. This is data independent acquisition mass spectrometry specifically. This is a way to operate the mass spectrometry to collect the data. Um, so in the, the typical mass spectrometric experiments, in this case for proteomics, uh, we, we, we have the, the, the protein extracts. First, there is a digestion step, and this is uh, the, the, the sample are analyzing first by a chromatography system that separates the, the peptides and then are analyzed in mass spectrometry. As these, um, these uh, mixtures are separated, in time, the mass spectrum uh, by the chromatography, then the mass spectrometer is collecting data over time. And then the, the, the standard approach, and what we mostly use here at PNNL2, is it's called the data dependent acquisition. So um, this means that because the instrument doesn't have time to scan for every, 
every peptide, every ion that we see the signal. So the, the default method is to just target or analyze a, 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 a top number of ions. So let's say typically top 10. So it means the instrument collects one MS1 spectrum that we call MS1 spectrum. It means you, you analyze, you, you detect the peaks of your intact molecules. And then uh, the instrument is selecting the top 10 most intense molecules to collect the MSMS spectra. So it, it goes through fragmentation because the, the fragmentation is what will allow us to, to do a better character, to characterize better the molecule and learn more about the, 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 the structure and then discriminate between molecules that may have the same mass, but the structure is different. And as we saw, there are techniques, we saw the presentations this morning that predict this MSMS spectrum. So this information is used then to annotate the mass spectrometric data to identify the molecules. But there is an, uh, another way to operate the instrument. And it's instead of selecting only one ion, you just say, just fragment everything. So the instrument is all the time uh, switching between um, a fragmentation and no fragmentation. So in this way, you can collect systematically MS1 or precursor data and fragment data. And the difference is that using this type of acquisition, we can create chromatography profiles, time profiles for the peaks of the fragments too. So we have the precursors and we have also the fragments in chromatography uh, uh, resolution, which is not the case with the DDA. Um, there are different ways of doing the DIA, um, but basically, yes, yeah, so I say we, we can, uh, the, the instrument can alternate between no fragmentation and fragmentation to fragment the whole range. Another type it's, uh, we can define multiple uh, isolation windows. So we have multiple uh, MSMS experiments. So it means, um, this is advantageous for complex samples because we, we reduce the chances of, of interference by when, when we fragment multiple molecules at the same time. And this is just on a schematic. We can do this in different type of mass spectrometers. Uh, the, 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 the basic one, the more, more uh, uh, used ones are the time of flight or, or, or orbit traps uh, in mass spectrometers, but the principle of, uh, of uh, concurrent fragmentation is basically the same. Yeah, so here, uh, going back, the difference is if we consider these gray boxes as the isolation windows that we, we do the selection of the ions to do the fragmentation. In DIA, we basically don't do a specific selection of ions, it's just fragmenting everything in a systematic way. This is like, imagine these, these points are all the ions from the sample. So it's doing all the time uh, in a deterministic way, the same, the same uh, data collection. And this, the, the, the advantages is that it's comprehensive because we are fragmenting everything. It's highly reproducible. And as I mentioned, the, the, the chromatography profiles, this, uh, the, the peak shape similarity will allow us to, to detect or not if a compound is present in the sample. The disadvantages is that the direct limb because of precursor, like an ion, and the MSMS or the fragments of that precursor is lost. So we need a more advanced algorithms to process this data. Uh, this is an example of, uh, it can be useful uh, a technique uh, using DIA compared to, to DDA for, in this case, for, for PTM analysis. This is a, this a, um, a histone uh, modification. We see that the blue one is the precursor peak. And it's the same because it's a, this, this, this specific uh, modification, it's just uh, modifying a different residue, but the precursor mass is the same. But then we can see that the, the profiles of the fragments are separated in time. And this will allow us to be confident that we have these two modifications in the, 
in the present in the sample, and we can use that to do accurate quantitation of each of the of the um, modifications of the uh, present uh, isoforms. DIA was uh, invented and initially applied for proteomics, but it's been now uh, lately becoming more popular also in, in metabolomics. And this is just an example of uh, the, it was compared like the number of uh, metabolite uh, features in urine samples. Uh, we can see that there are some advantages, improve the quantitations and improve the, the number of, of, of confident annotations of number of metabolites that can be identified in the sample. Of course, there are some disadvantages. Uh, there are cases uh, where the quality of the MSMS is, it will always be better in DDA because you are, uh, the instrument is isolating that specific, uh, uh, that specific uh, precursor, but the overall, the, the advantages for quantitation, the, the, the typical workflow use first EDA to build a library, and then you use DIA to do your analysis of, of all your, uh, your large scale of multiple samples to do the quantitation. So. All right, so now we'll talk about ion mobility. Even doing this fragmentation, as we saw, there are some molecules that still fragment the same and they elute at the same time. So one of the approach uh, that we are, we are uh, taking here is to add the ion mobility separation. So basically this is another stage of separation that is added between the liquid chromatography and the mass spectrometry. And then what it does, what it does is per each uh, retention time point, we, we activate this separation state that we will further separate our, our ions. And then we have more information to characterize the molecules. As we heard this morning uh, from Professor Fernandez, the collision cross-section is a value that is related to the shape and the side of the molecule. And we can use it to, to characterize and distinguish uh, molecules based on the on their structure, and we can from the ion from from the ion mobility uh, measurements, we can then calculate collision cross section. Yeah, and Jeremy presented a poster today. Um, uh, Jun Lee and I developed a pipeline to to do an automated calculation of collision cross section from experimental data, but this wasn't really user friendly. So Jeremy, working with Jeremy and Sarah, uh, Jeremy put this into a nice uh, user interface and now it's easier to, to, to use. Here I want to quickly mention uh, this tool called the PNNL preprocessor. It's a tool that we developed and maintained here at PNNL in collaboration with Agilent Technologies. This is a tool that was developed especially for ion mobility data. And the tool, what it does is takes the raw file that comes from the instrument. It applies multiple uh, available algorithms to improve the quality of the raw data and then creates an output file that is in the same format as the, as the, as the instrument, and the, the instrument format. And this is me with the long hair, but it's me. <laughs> This is an example now of ion mobility, uh, how it can be used to separate isomeric molecules. So we can distinguish them and be more confident about the identification. Ion mobility can, uh, can be combined with some other post-processing techniques um, to improve the resolution, the, the separation. And there is a, uh, algorithm called high resolution demultiplexing that we use in combination with the PNNL preprocessor to generate this kind of uh, uh, post, post acquisition improvement of uh, the resolution, the resolving power of the ion mobility. This is an example of how useful the, the collision cross section can be. Yes, we can identify like trend trend of molecules in the in the samples
we heard about uh, methods for collision cross-section prediction for metabolites this morning. There are also methods for collision cross-section prediction for peptides, given the, the, um, the peptide sequence uh, and using deep learning models that have proved to be very, very successful. All right, so now talking about the how we put all this together. This is a long introduction about the different techniques because the algorithm that I created is actually to process this kind of data. So how we combine uh, data, uh, data independent acquisition with ion mobility is then the instrument uh, alternates again between uh, no collision energy and collision energy, but then also uh, activating the ion mobility separation, and then we can collect data systematically of the precursors and the fragments that are separated in chromatography time and also in mobility time. All right, so for, for machine learning, Yes, we need we need training data in this in this case. Uh, what I'm using is a supervised algorithm and training a support vector machine uh, model to learn the data. Uh, what I want the algorithm is to learn how to distinguish true coelution from false coelution or low quality coelution. So I want to train a model that will tell me if I give it the the, the let's say we have the MSMS spectrum predicted using one of those methods that we saw in the morning, right? So then I, we can take those fragments and look in this kind of data and I want them all to tell me, yes, that molecule is there or not. So for that, uh, I will explain what this uh, feature finding means, but it basically there are methods that we can use kind of like in an unsupervised way to, to detect all the features and the peaks, the fragment peaks that align well without any annotation. So I'm taking that uh, to then create a list of targets. And from those, I'm generating a list of decoys that I'm then I'm, I'm using those to train the algorithm. But after doing the, the feature detection on target of feature detection, do this deconvolution, I apply another step that is targeted data extraction. So it means I will go back to the raw data to extract those peaks and extract some peak metrics. And then I train the algorithm. And then once the algorithm is trained, the method is trained, okay, I develop this one in R. And I use for the targeted data extraction, I use a tool called Skyline and therefore fragment decolution uh, MS dial. And then the last step is the inference. So then once we have this model that is trained, then we have a library of no molecules, then we can query the data using this model to say, okay, do I have signals that coelute and, and, and have the same comorbidity to say, okay, this, this, this molecule is it present in the, in the, in the sample. The first step, yes, is the uh, targeted feature finding and MSMS convolution. As I mentioned, this step, what it does is just detect every peak in the sample and we look for the, for, the, for the fragment peaks that align well and will generate an output without any annotation. Then uh, here I'm using a simple model to generate decoys. What, I, what I'm doing is after I extract um, those features that were detected in an untargeted way, um, I pair them using some rules, like they have to be like a similar masses so, so they, 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 they could be like more, realistic, more realistic. And then basically I just pair them and then, um, I swap some of the fragments randomly, and then I can use this to train the model. The ones that coelute very well are my targets. And then when I do this swapping and I extract the data uh, in, a, in a targeted way, then the ones that are 
decoys, they won't have a nice elution uh, profile. So then that will, will, will tell the algorithm to recognize which one looks good and which one looks bad, basically. This is how the targeted uh, extraction looks like. And, and the tool basically, I just, the targeted extraction from the GIA data, it's a powerful approach because um, it's, it's, it, it's less sensitive to noise. So if you extract this, this signals in a targeted way, you have a clear and more, more, um, more it, it's more likely to find the, the right peaks. So that's why I'm combining these two steps. And the, the metrics, the XIC, the XIC is extracted ion chromatogram. Um, the, the metrics to describe the peaks are the mass error, the, the abundance of the area, and the peak width. So molecules, the precursor of fragments that have similar peak, peak shapes will have similar peak width similar retention time. So after I extract those uh, peak metrics, then I can generate a table with half the descriptors. And these groups of precursor and fragments are called, uh, I call it a, yeah, we call it a peak group. And then we can calculate metrics for each peak group and basically apply our supervised uh, machine learning uh, training where I tell it, okay, these are the metrics. Uh, in this case, yes, I have metric, the cosine similarity that it's comparing the extracted areas, comparing with the expected areas and the retention time difference. And this case, I'm using the mean for the group and yes, uh, I compute those for the target and the coy. And then in this case, I'm using this uh, uh, package for, for training the, the SVM. Um, and yes, I'm using uh, tenfold uh, cross-validation and using this command, we can save the model that is already trained to use it later. Uh, this is an example of how uh, the output of the training will look in a confusion matrix. Again, this is the training using the targets and decoys that I generated from the raw data independent of any, any library. And we can see that uh, any of these metrics individually, they don't do, that the best one is the cosine, but they don't really do a great uh, separation of the targets and decoys. But when we combine them, using the support vector machine and we can convert that as a, uh, we can calculate a probability and convert that into a score. This is a binary classifier, but you can convert that into a, a probability and into a, a score. We can see that the performance, it's, it's, uh, it's improved when we combine all these metrics together and the, the, algorithm, the, the model is learning how to distinguish the P groups that look, uh, basically they correlate compared with the peak groups that they are not, that they are the decoys. So then one, after the model is trained, um, I have another step where I load the model and then we use the same methods to calculate the, the descriptors. But now I, I query the, the raw data be using uh, as seeds, the library. So now we have these fragments, fragments and precursor from the molecules in a library, for example, a predicted one. And then I can extract those signal from the raw data. And I can use the same model that I already trained to, to evaluate if the, the signals for that molecule uh, look consistent or not. And this is an example uh, we applied it with a library of 64 metabolites. Um, I will explain more about the, the, the project, but yes, um, we can see here the, the score, the final score, and then 
for in, in met, for the metabolites, he, there are some molecules that are detect that are not detected with fragments. So in that case, we cannot really apply the model and say that we have fragmentation to to identify those metabolites. But still, since this is using we created a library from standards, we have the retention time and the collision cross section, and that will give us an idea of the of the of the identity of that peak even if we don't have the, the MSMS. So this, uh, this work was done in the context of the Agile Biofoundry Consortium of National Laboratories for uh, a synthetic biology study. Let's say we studied these uh, three uh, organisms, microorganisms, and uh, this is the, the, the team, the, the closest member of the team that I work with. Uh, I don't generate any of these data, I'm only computational. So Natalie developed uh, chromatography methods. These are very fast separation, eight, eight minutes. And Jushin uh, uh, implemented and optimizing, uh, optimized uh, chromatography methods for, for proteomics using 30 minutes. And Danny operated the, the um, ion mobility instrument and Christine is the, the PI of the of the project. So this is an example of the results that we got. Jung Hoon did the pathway, this pathway, this clustering and pathway modeling here is an example where we compare wild type with, uh, with uh, three different uh, modified strains. Basically they, they look similar, but what we saw is that the modifications don't, those strain basically activated the pathways that we were uh, that were designed for uh, to be uh, to activate, and in this these results shows one of the comparisons. Uh, the arrows are uh, proteomics data, and the circles are the metabolite uh, data, and we basically saw that they mostly agree in the in the profiles. So now towards peak decoder two, yeah, as you saw for that version that I previously described, we need uh, to define what are those features, what are those uh, uh, descriptors that I will tell the support vector machine to, to learn to distinguish uh, the, the, the signals that are uh, have good coelution or not to identify. So what I'm working now is, is to use deep learning, as I say, it's, uh, it will extract and learn the, the patterns automatically and has been shown success as we saw uh, with, uh, for example, AlphaGo uh, and, and AlphaFold now, AlphaFold too. But then the question, we, we have seen deep learning in mass spec is being used uh, um, uh, a lot very recently, but mostly for prediction for prediction of molecular properties. But then the question is, can we use also deep learning for this kind of analysis that I show? So it won't be precisely like prediction of MSMS or retention time as you So can we use deep learning to process the data for the molecular identification? And we can think about, yes, using the same concept of transfer learning, we can look at the, the mass spec data. As in this case, we have the, the, the pedestrians we can think of, okay, I want the, the model to learn. Basically, the, instead of pedestrian, I want the model to learn to recognize the peak group. And then the, the multiple, multiple fragments. Uh, and this is an example of, of the model that I want to test. Uh, I need to modify the architecture because uh, this uh, architecture for image recognition uh, Dylan will show an example. Basically, you have three channels, but here we want to identify molecules. And if we want to use uh, multiple fragments, I need to add more than three channels. And we can, yes, uh, detect the boundaries of the P group, and then we can use uh, the softmax uh, soft function, for example, to, to define the center and what is the retention time and the CCS or the mobility time. To do that, we need to look at the data a little bit different 
to the P groups that I showed you before. Uh, so we can do an image representation and then extract uh, what we call a, a two-dimensional extracted ion chromatogram, mobilogram. So, and then we can train the model to, to find, to overlay, as I say, in this case, it will have a, a AA channels and then to detect where is that area with these signals all overlap. And uh, because the model does not depend on fragmentation rules, we can apply the same for peptides. In this case, uh, we expect it to, to detect also uh, patterns that are the, to the human eye will be difficult, uh, but then the, the, the model to learn and find those those patterns, but even uh, into when they have like low signal to noise, it's very noisy in noisy areas. And this is an example of uh, data that we are working on uh, when we have a spiked, we have a heavy heavy labeled peptides. So it means um, peptides that are synthesized when they have a mass shift compared to the endogenous one. We can use those as, as reference to do quantitation. This is an overview of what I said. Uh, uh, the idea is to do an image representation uh, and to generate the decoys in the same way that I described before to train the model and then do the apply that train model to do the inference. Finally, I want to uh, mention about this, uh, this tool uh, that we created um to convert the mass spectrometry data one of the bottlenecks that we have it's that especially this data it's uh, we have uh, four dimensions so i have more separations the typical tools uh, are not very uh are, are not designed they don't handle well like a big amount of, of, of data the files are large and then the typical uh formats use for open source software, it's based on, they are based on XML. So I designed this converter to take the, the data from the raw uh, format. The thing is the mass spectrometry data typically is stored in instrument and vendor format that are closed, they are proprietary. And then we need to convert to open. So because we have this collaboration with Agenet Technologies, I, I, I have knowledge of how to do that conversion. And then we can parse all that data and dump it into a basically an HDFI file. And this converter, it's, uh, it's uh, self-contained, it's fully portable. We have tested in multiple Windows 10 systems. Uh, and we have tested also in, in, in Unix-like systems and in, in Linux specifically. And the only requisite is the wine uh, compatibility layer. And Dylan will explain how we are using uh, these tools to build uh, uh, omics tools, um, in this case for, for lipid omics. And this, is, this allows us to not deal with the complexity of the vendor libraries or these huge software, uh, these huge files with these open uh, formats, system formats. All right, so my, my, for my conclusions here quickly, yes, yeah, so AI ML, they are enabling new discovery in omics and uh, every researcher is to have a basic understanding of this context to, of these concepts to, to take advantage of it. Uh, these methods that I explained today, uh, they are available for MSOL users and the chromatography methods and, and they are also applied applicable to other uh, uh, studies beyond beyond the synthetic biology. Uh, the combination of the retention time, the CCS, and the, the fragmentation, the comorbidity, and the pollution of the fragmentation. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a powerful combination to give more confidence in the, of the overall uh, molecular identification. And we are working to, to make a uh, peak decoder, as say, uh, using uh, deep learning and make it also available for 
for uh, for data with and without ion mobility, and and also exploring also uh, metabolomics, uh, lipidomics, and proteomics. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you for your attention. And now, if there is any question. Thank you. It's definitely a very important tool you can use, benefit a lot from. So uh, I think I'm mostly curious about how did you uh, construct your training data? I think you mentioned you uh, make decoys from these targets. And uh, so do, does that also mean you also uh, make decoys for not only just as MS1, but also MS2, MS1 and two, have you considered of a using some sort of a false positives instead of making decoys like those noise that exists there might also identify it as a peak, but it's not real peak. So, and two is like, uh, if we are trying to use this tool, do we need to train this model using our own data or we can just use the model you have trained because different instrument or different results might have different performance. They like what you have on your data might not apply to other data set or other other results so what 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 are your thoughts on that thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. great great questions um so for the decoys yeah maybe it's too much information i went too fast through it but basically the decoy it's a p group that contains it's it's composed of the precursor plus the fragment so actually i keep the the same precursor the precursor is still there the signal, but I'm just swapping and making the fragments uh, present or not. But because the way that we are processing the data then with the library, with the real molecules to extract the signals, um, if you don't find the MS1 peak, there is no point of keep going and, and then trying to identify because your first metric to, to be confident is to that you have an MS1 peak. It won't make sense that you have only fragments and then no MS1 peak. That could happen, by the way, it could be like another version or uh, in source fragmentation, other, other kind of things that can happen. But in principle, it won't be a confident identification. You cannot say that you have good signals for that precursor in the data because you don't see the MS1. So that's the reason I keep, I keep the, the MS1 because there is like a pre-filtering step. Yeah. And the next question, uh, if, that's something that I'm looking into testing. Like I compare this with three different data sets. Uh, they have different complexities. Uh, basically, when when I don't have enough peaks in data, the model is not trained great. So it really doesn't do a good job. Um, I, but in principle, if you analyze other sample with the same chromatography, in the same fragmentation conditions, you should be able to use uh, already trained model to score in that new sample. But that's something that I'm still investigating if we, if it's a uh, good and what is the limit, like if you can trust it, like uh, uh, how often or when it's valid or not. So yeah, thank you, great point. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, uh, first, with respect to proteomics um, and um, post-translational modification of proteins, under circumstances where you're not really sure what the modification is or what part of the protein is being modified. For example, in a simple case, if you had a, a protein that you could fish out with an antibody or something like that and fragment it um, and find under certain conditions or in certain uh, genomic backgrounds, uh, hereditary backgrounds, um, there was one fragment that suddenly moved or disappeared altogether um, and didn't show up in mass spec or and the rest of the protein did, or maybe it changed its place in, in the elution pattern or the spectrum. And so that would be pretty easy uh, that you identify, okay, this, you know, amino acid such through such has got that modification on it, and I can make some guesses about what it is or figure out what it is in terms of the masses. 
but what if what if it were a circumstance where you were looking at um, a, a meta proteome, uh, which um, <clears throat> might under certain circumstances have suite of proteins whose fragments are pretty well identified, but had something in a different setting, a different genetic background, for example, uh, that um, a given peptide just simply disappeared, or um, there was a new peptide that showed up someplace else. Is that something that you can um, use one of these learning systems uh, to sort of have it be, it's the sort of thing that you would notice right away as a human being. <laughs> but um, is, it, is that something that is part of um, the algorithms that, that you guys are working with that you could notice something that was out of place? Some, yeah, I can't, I'm, some I'm not sure where I'm... Library, but, but there is a great potential here because precisely the instrument is fragmenting all the ions. Oh, oh, oh I, I was too far from there. Yeah, so uh, because, because in DIA, the instrument is fragmenting everything that is in the sample, then we have the, the possibility to re-query the data if you know like your potential modification is another position, you can generate in silico those uh, mass to charge values and then query the data and then interrogate and see which one of those modifications is giving you a better signal. Yeah. Because we have the chromatogram for all the fragments. So yes, we can interrogate the data and look for, for different modifications. So it would also apply, for example, in a case where you had a, a substitution uh, of an amino acid. And the thing would uh, show it would show up in a different spot because it had a different mass. Um, but um, yeah, so so if there is a substitution and we have in the library uh, one version uh, that gives let's say gives a partial match because not all the fragments are fra are, are, right. <clears throat> are detected right not are are yeah. query just extracted to see so you can we can adapt them to this form B that we want to test and see, again, extract the fragments, say, do I have signal for that other substitution? And yes, mm -hmm. the data will tell us because if we see that those chromatograms that coelute, that will give, that will give you a suggestion that that other form is, is the one that is more likely. Okay, I, my, I have one more question and that is, um, to what degree is, uh, this kind of mass spec, sort of forensic mass spec, being applied to uh, nucleic acids, specifically RNA. To what degree are applied to RNA? We well, are currently doing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Can you clarify again, please? So I'm, I mean, it, 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 are you guys running RNA as, as an as like transcriptomics? Uh, not sequencing it, but doing mass spec with the um, the raw, I mean, the purified RNA, messenger RNA. I'm thinking primarily about structural RNAs or regulatory RNAs, the, the micro RNAs uh, that, that are smaller than um, the uh, structural RNAs, which can be separated as, if, if you, you, you can separate the small RNAs, <clears throat> but you don't know necessarily what they are, uh, because it's not clear in, in every case um, that something is um, is not a message that it's it's actually a structural RNA or or a regulatory RNA. Yeah, 